Okay, play one. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of The Scope here on British Muslim TV with me, your host, Wakar Rizvi. We're back with another episode in this new year, and this time we're discussing U.S.-Iran relations. Now, it was on this day, January 3rd in 1988, that a U.S. missile shot down an Iranian civilian passenger airliner. It was also on this very day, January 3rd in 2020, that a U.S. drone killed an Iranian Major General, Qasem Soleimani. These events have had an important impact on the Iranian psyche and the Iranian point of view on America. Now, though the U.S. unilaterally walked away from the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, Iran still believes it can be revived, though American willingness to compromise is questionable at this time. Now, with U.S. sanctions increasing as well as domestic tensions within Iran, what is next for U.S.-Iran relations? To discuss those questions and others, we're now joined by Yusuf Azizi, who is an international security expert as well as PhD candidate in public policy at Virginia Tech. Uh, he is joining us from Washington. And joining us from Tehran is Hamid Raza Ghulamzadeh, who is a foreign policy expert and a PhD candidate in American studies at the University of Tehran. He also serves as a deputy for international affairs at the municipality of Tehran. Hamid Reza and Yusuf, thank you both for taking your time out to join us here in the scope here on British Muslim TV. Uh, Hamid Reza, if I can, I'd like to start with you. Um, as I said, this is the anniversary of two very important events for Iranians and in Iranian history. How do you reflect on this day as well as where Iran currently stands in its point of view of the United States? You know, as you mentioned, the uh, the anniversaries are very important to the Iranians, especially the last one, which was uh, three years ago, the terror attack on uh, General Soleimani, who was the most uh, favored people, most popular people person in the in whole Iran. And you can see it and you can remember that uh, when the funeral happened across Iran, millions of people turned to the streets to uh, commemorate him and take part in the funeral ceremony. So that is an event which is not being too forgiven or forgotten by Iranians. And if, even if we did not have the history of relations between Iran and the United States and all the things that the Americans have done to the Iranians, this single event was enough to uh, prove the hostility of the United States against Iran and the Iranian people would not forgive them uh, um, because of that single event. But the point is that the history between the two countries dates back to the coup, which was long before the Islamic Republic. So the hostility is not just about the, the, the so-called regime in Iran or the, the, the governing system in, in Iran. It is about the region and about the position and the role that Iran can play or is playing in the region in a region which is very important strategic in the whole world. Uh, so we have the history of the coup against Mossadegh at the time. Uh, and then after that, the support that the Americans showed uh, for Shah when, uh, after the Islamic Revolution happened in 1979. And after that, we have had several, several things that have happened by them. The, the other coups that the Americans were trying to do, the, the plots like what happened in uh, the Tabas, uh, they wanted to uh, free the diplomats in the uh, the, the, the so-called den of espionage uh, or the former U.S. embassy in Tehran, or the other coups that they were supporting, the support that they have always had for the terrorist groups uh, uh, in, in different parts of Iran, either in uh, eastern part, eastern borders, or in the uh, western borders, uh, they have supported clearly yeah. and overtly they have uh, actually supported many terrorist groups or separatist groups. All these things are the the, the uh, incidents in the history that the uh, Iranian nation has witnessed for so long. So uh, these are the all the things that has led to this situation. That and that's because of this that Iranians okay. chant. So if, 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 if I may, if I bring Yusuf in, into this as well, Hamid Reza, because Yusuf, you know, on the other side, of course, the Americans probably have their own list of grievances and events. 
um, in which they can hold a grudge against the Iranians, right? So on top of the list is, of course, the hostage crisis, but then there are others as well in these in these years as well. What do you make of the American point of view on the Iranians at this point in time, in your opinion, as well as, you know, in this relationship, um, is it more lopsided uh, towards American, you know, actions against Iran, or do you think it's it's fairly equal in that regard? Yeah, as you said, we can digging up the history and both sides have some claims to mention about that. Uh, but uh, what happened during the Obama administration is to look forward and uh, to engage Iran in some international affairs because of the interest of the United States. As we know, uh, the global uh, international politics shifting to the east, especially to the China and uh, the United States uh, area of hegemony. Uh, was ended, or at least it is uh, changing. So the United States tried to, uh, um, you know, to bring all of the troops, all of the resources, energy, money to the East Asia to, uh, you know, uh, overcome within the China's growth in that region. And what's happening in the uh, last two uh, decades in the U.S. foreign policy, especially beginning from the war on terror and um, um, new Middle East or greater Middle East uh, policy of uh, Bush doctrine is to wasting money in the Middle East, about more than $10,000 billion investing in Middle East. And what's the final uh, result is nothing, just shaking hands with Taliban again. So uh, the, the Obama doctrine, which he mentioned during the uh, the long interview with Atlantic uh, uh, magazine is that uh, he tries to make a balance in Persian Gulf between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, it, it helps the United States to bring its resources out of the region uh, to not waste the time, money, energy, and the life of American uh, in the uniform. So uh, what's happening is that uh, the Iranian also used that uh, leverage to you know, get some benefits from China and Russia, because uh, we can see recently, especially that Saudi Arabia and Turkey, Turkey is a member of NATO, is a member of OECD. Saudi Arabia has the longest standing allies with uh, Western uh, countries, especially United States. They also get benefits from relation to China and Russia. But Iran uh, has a long history of uh, adversary with the West. Uh, it, it, it has relation, a good relation with China and Russia, but it cannot get the complete potential of benefits from those countries. So uh, I believe that Iran wants it to get this balance between its relation between uh, East and uh, West of uh, um, Eastern and Western side of the international politics. But what happening with Trump administration to withdraw from the JCPOA with killing and assassination of the general of Soleimani is that uh, it ended any kind of negotiation between Iran and the former American administration, the Trump administration. Uh, what I believe from Iranian side is that uh, they put all of the, uh, you know, uh, penalties and fault on Trump administration, his advisors, the people who commending or encouraging uh, in yeah. the uh, Trump cabinet members. Uh, but Iranian also willing to, you know, engage with the current administration, the a Biden administration, if they see a good view on, on from that, on that point, if, if I may, Yusuf, because that's a good point, Hamid Reza, that Yusuf has just brought up, right, where uh, even expediency council member Mohammed Sadr has, in fact, criticized, right, Iran's what he's called, at least I'm paraphrasing, him, of course, it's not an exact quote, uh, one sided foreign policy, which is in favor of the Chinese and the Russians, because we know that the Chinese just recently signed on to a GCC a communique in which there was criticism of Iran, right, especially when it came to the three islands, as well as Iran's other activities within the Middle East region. And of course, the Iranians did in a mild form, at least protest against the Chinese accepting that statement of the GCC members. Now, I wonder, is this time, in a sense, for the Iranians to reevaluate whether or not they should, in fact, have good relations with a country like the United States? Uh, you know, uh, Iran has always been open to having relations with either East or West. Uh, during uh, Rouhani administration, uh, when he was in, in president, he was totally toward West. And he actually uh, missed the opportunity of having relations with China, which at that time was working with Iran extensively despite the sanctions. It was before the JCPOA. 
But right after the JCP was signed, uh, Rouhani and his government just turned toward the West. And that was actually putting all the eggs in the basket of the Western countries. And we all saw the result of that. But technically, and basically, what Iran's foreign policy has been is that to, uh, to, to actually uh, consider its sovereignty and uh, meanwhile have relations with different countries. So Iran is open to the relations. But the point is that the difficulty is from the other side. The problem is from the other side. Uh, Yusuf just mentioned about the Obama administration. And he was he's right. In, in, at the very beginning of his uh, coming to office, his term in 2009, Obama wrote a letter to the leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei. And he was very positive in that. And actually, he welcomed having relations with Iran. But as soon as some, some uh, unrest happened uh, after the election at that time, if you, rem you well remember the 2009 presidential election in Iran, and we had some uh, opposition, some unrest at the time. As soon as that happened and it, it erupted, uh, the Americans got back to the uh, obsession with the regime change policy and all the pressure that have, they had and the sanction policy and all those things. And they again began the same uh, procedure. Uh, despite the positive uh, policy that they had acquired, actually, at the very beginning of the uh, Obama's uh, term. Uh, it happened again and again. And finally, we had the uh, walking away from the JCPOA. And after that, despite all the criticism that President Biden had, or let's say uh, candidate Biden had uh, against uh, President Trump at the time, after coming to office, Biden did nothing uh, to uh, reverse what President Trump had done about uh, JCP and killing the deal. So uh, the, the 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 reluctance is from the American side, and Iran has always said that it is open to that. Iran uh, is moving away from the sanctions and trying to, uh, let's say, to nullify the sanctions or the the, the impact of the sanctions. Uh, and yet it welcomes uh, easing of the sanctions and it would ease the economy. There is no doubt about that. Iran is trying, on one hand, to eliminate the impact of the sanctions and to work despite the sanctions and forget about removing sanctions. The need for and the necessity of removal of sanctions has already, uh, let's let's say, uh, removed actually from the Iranian economy. But on the other side, it is important for Iranians to make make this sanctions sanctions lifted so that benefit from the ease of sanctions at the time of uh, when uh, a possible negotiation is actually happening in the uh, Iran okay. and the West. Now, Yusuf, I'm going to start this half off with you and ask you about um, whether you believe, um, as the Iranians do, that the U.S. policy towards their country has always really been about regime change. Uh, is that true in your opinion? Uh, yes, and sometimes no. But, uh, you know, uh, United States policy as something apparent on the, um, um, on the TV or what's uh, publicly announced by the U.S. government after the uh, Bush administration, when he, uh, has the, uh, he, ha he had the doctrine of uh, put Iran in the axis of evil. But after that, um, all of that, the U.S. administration said, OK, there is no regime change policy toward Iran. Uh, we wanted that Iran's behavior toward the Middle East, toward the, uh, its missile program, all of these change. So the changing behavior of Iran, especially, especially about the regional security affairs, uh, we wanted to change that one. So uh, the whole sanction is about the changing Iranian behavior, uh, about the nuclear policy, about the military policy, the proxy uh, movement in the region, and the missile program, all of that. Uh, so the Obama administration uh, thought that if he could go step by step, and the best and most important one is to resolve first and foremost uh, the nuclear program, the nuclear ambition of Iran, and then uh, open the space, open the way to go and talk about the regional activity, the missiles issues. Uh, but Trump administration had, the, had this mistake to bring all of the files, all of the pro uh, problems that United States Iran had uh, during the uh, last uh, four decades, all of them at the once on the table. And OK, this is not something that Iranian are going to negotiate on that. This is not something that the, uh, um, all of the um, other powers, uh, the global powers, especially the other four members of the, um, the UN Security Council, uh, wanted to negotiate on that. So um, we know that the uh, maximum pressure of Trump administration was miserably 
uh, you know, mistaken and defeated by not Iran, just, but uh, all members of the UN National Security Council. Uh, so the Biden administration had very uh, challenging, you know, uh, facing a very challenging time. It wanted to revive the JCPOA. It, it wanted to bring the Obama policy back uh, to the table. But on the other hand, um, recent unrest in Iran, then the human rights uh, pressure, but some you know lobbies in the United States, the Congress pressure as always, uh, the Israeli policy pressure on uh, Biden administration, all of that avoided uh, uh, Biden to. Uh, revived the JCP at the very first month he went to the uh, to the office. That's the honeymoon time. That's the best time. He missed that time. And when he missed that time and the Iranian administration changed, the Rouhani uh, administration is gone, the Raisi administration come to the um, uh, admi uh, in uh, Tehran's imposter Tehran. So uh, there are many challenges there because the new administration in Iran wanted to make sure that if JCPOA is revived, it has some guarantees by the United States that the next administration wouldn't leave it like Trump administration. And it has many benefits, sustainable benefits for Iranian uh, future. So I guess there are some problems between the domestic policies of the United States that Obama wanted to make a balance between them to, you know, to serve as their national and international interests with engaging with Iran and also avoiding the domestic politics to uh, uh, to um, uh, to um, have negative effects on uh, Biden administration. Right. Um, Hamid Reza, you know, when we're talking about as far as where the JCPOA currently stands, right, so Rob Maddy, who, you know, as, as you well know, is a U.S. envoy for Iran, um, he's quite clearly said that, in fact, there were a number of proposals put to the Iranians, but that the Iranians themselves did not accept those proposals. And, you know, a lot of those proposals, in fact, came from European countries. So why is Iran playing hardball right now if it wants, as you said, the sanctions to be lifted? Uh, you know, Iran is trying to be pragmatical and practical in terms of the negotiations because it wants to really use the uh, deal on the ground. It wants the sanctions removed. And if it is just on the papers, like what it was in 2015, uh, to, um, let's say, actually, it was like that. Uh, so it is not, it would not really be working for Iranian economy. So Iran wants it practically lifting the sanctions so that Iran can trade with the world and have all the uh, possibilities that it expects from the negotiations. But what the other side is putting on the table is just some uh, something that is not uh, fully uh, observing the JCPOA and it's not fully removing the sanctions, and it is all, always keeping some grounds to impose further sanctions on, on other areas, like, for example, about the human, human rights areas or support for terrorism and such things. They are keeping on the ground so that they can put further sanctions, regardless of the nuclear issue, in order not to practically and uh, really lifting the sanctions uh, for Iran. That is the problem. Just remember what uh, when uh, President Trump imposed uh, human rights sanctions on, uh, with a human rights label on aluminum, aluminum and such things, some, some metal industry in Iran. It has nothing to do with human rights, but they put the sanctions on that because they want it uh, not working after the sanction, removal of the sanctions under the nuclear label. But that is actually the, the problem. Iran is seeking the real change. Iran is seeking the removal of the sanctions on the ground, not just on the paper. And what the other side is offering is not like that. It's just, uh, just giving some bonuses so that, for example, uh, freeing the Iranian uh, frozen assets in South Korea, like $7 billion, it, it is Iranian money. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with the sanctions or the nuclear issue and such things. They have just frozen it, it, it illegally. And now they want to sell it to the Iranians. And because of that, they want some, some benefits from that. So. It is not a way that the sanctions and the negotiations, uh, sorry, the negotiations would be working really. So that's the problem. It's not a playing hardball. It's not being stubborn on the negotiation. It is just wanting the real outcome from the negotiation desk. 
you know, Yusuf, um, if I may play the devil's advocate for another moment, the Americans and, and others who are critical of Iran would say, in fact, Iran is a bad faith actor in international geopolitics because, um, you know, there are accusations that the Iranian drones are being used by the Russians, for example, in Ukraine, um, as well as, you know, other Iranian activities over the years in the Middle East region as well, such as support for the Houthis, support for Bashar al-Assad, all of the above, even if those were strategic moves, nevertheless, on the part of Western countries, that those would be viewed as as bad faith geopolitics. What do you what do you make of that and the impact that that then has, of course, on relations with the United States? Yeah, I think we have uh, the anticipation or we we could anticipate that uh, if, uh, for example, the JCPOA was revived um, before the election in Iran in um, uh, 2021 or uh, before the Russia-Ukraine war erupted last year or this February 2022. So uh, we would see that the Iranian oils uh, went to the free market especially go to the, uh, you know, the uh, European countries. Uh, we would assume that Iran wouldn't help Russia, wouldn't back Russia in the uh, Ukraine-Russia war, wouldn't send its drones to the uh, Russia. So, you know, the Obama administration policy is to engage little by little, step by step with Iran, with all to, to you know, to uh, address all of these cases, all of these issues. Because Iran has its own uh, interest in the region. It has its own security dilemma in the region. So uh, it is one-sided if you said that Iran should abandon all of this relationship with Russia, with China, or all of the uh, supporting with um, Syrian regime, or Iraqi regime, or Yemeni, regi uh, Yemeni government, or uh, the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, because all of the other actors in the region, the Saudis, the Emirates, the Qataris, Turkish, all of these do some bad behavior and do some interference in other countries. So the dilemma in the Middle East is just, um, you know, the security in the Middle, Middle East is just could be sustainable uh, with the negotiation by, by the peoples and the, uh, the, and the states in the region and not what's the interfere of other global uh, powers uh, to interfere in the region and activities. So what Iran said is that, okay, if you come and revive the JCPOA as it was in 2015, because Iran's position is that not one word less or one word more, uh, one word more uh, from the JCPOA. It, it, if we revive the JCPOA, if we see the benefit in the coming years, we can reopen and negotiate in other activities, other issues with Western countries, with uh, all of the region, uh, regional countries. But if you cannot abide by the commitment, by the uh, by the um, uh, negotiation, by the deal that we all sign, and it is the international regulation, it is the re international law, according to the United yeah. Nations Security Council 2021, uh, 2231 resolution. So if you cannot abide by this, how we could tr trust you on the regional issues and the security dilemma in the uh, region? So this is a two-sided issue. Iran needs to talk to the West. West needs to talk to Iran too. Indeed. Okay, Hamid Reza, we just have about a minute and a half, so I'm getting you the final word. Um, and I know this is a very generalized question, but do you think that things are about to get a lot worse in 2023? We have a very, very right-wing government in Israel, for example, but at the same time, we have Iran-Saudi talks also happening. So how, how do you see things happening then with the U.S.? Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, what we expect in the, in, in the upcoming uh, days or years uh, would be actually no other choice but to talk to Iran and to work with Iran. Or there would be some something like war, something like a, a, a serious conflict, at least in the region. And if it's in the region, it would be actually the whole world, I guess. Uh, but uh, I think if the Iran resists, resists as it has done so far, it would lead to gradually lead to negotiations and having some talks, as it is happening with Saudi Arabia. It would be with others as well. And I expect that uh, it finally uh, bring Americans to the desk, uh, the negotiation negotiation desk, so to reach some agreements sooner or later. 
Very well. We'll leave there as a final word, but we really, really appreciate Hamid Reza Balamzadeh and Yusuf Azizi for taking their time out Thank of their you. no doubt busy schedules to speak to us today here in the scope here on British Muslim TV. We really appreciate their insight and time. Viewers, we got through quite a bit there discussing Iran US relations. Of course, uh, the domestic issues in Iran have an important role in this, as well as as our guests alluded to as well. Um, the human rights issue, as as the Americans bring up, and, and they have through the recent sanctions that they placed on the country, but also, of course, things like the assassination of Qasem Soleimani in 2020 and other such events which remain engraved in the Iranian psyche continue to define those relations going forward. We'll keep an eye, of course, on how those relations develop in 2023. I'll be back next week with an another important topic. Do stay tuned for that. Thank you very much for watching. Almost 150,000 Canadians a year will use a homeless shelter. These people need food, clothing, and access to basic hygiene. Fatima Zara Helping Hand is a nonprofit organization with the goal of helping the underprivileged in Canada. Along with our active support for recent immigrants and refugees, one of our ongoing initiatives is to feed and clothe the homeless. For more than a decade, we have provided hundreds of thousands of hot meals to some of the most vulnerable and needy. We continue these efforts with several monthly initiatives. For more information or to donate, please visit our website, nurmuhammad.com.